Chapter 231 Cyrenius Provides for Joseph's House Following this childly interlude, the morning meal was completed. And when Joseph finished with the prayer of thanksgiving, Cyrenius went over to him and said, My dearest friend, your service to me as well as to my brother Julius Augustus Quirinus Caesar in Rome, are of such an outstanding nature that I shall never be able to recompense you therefore. But to leave you altogether unrewarded, that is utterly impossible to me. Now I know that you will not accept a kingly reward from me. So I have decided on the following. This year, as is evident, you can expect a poor harvest in grain, when after all your house has quite a number of dwellers. Besides, nine of them belong to me, and you and yours also total eight, so there are altogether seventeen. Now I know in my soul that your flour bins are empty, and also your larder, and that you are already running short of feed for your cows, goats and donkeys. See, all of that I know very well. As I also know that you and yours have almost nothing more to wear. Therefore, my dearest brother, you must at least accept enough from me to fill your needs for the present. I am of course well aware that it would be extremely ridiculous for a man of the earth to undertake to support the Lord of creation for whom it is an easy thing to create myriads of worlds with one word. But I also know that this self-same holy Lord of creation does not wish to constantly effect wonders contrary to his eternal wondrous order, because a judgment is always connected with that for us, his creatures. For that reason, you must accept what you need this time at least, and not refuse me as you usually do. And Joseph replied, Yes, brother, this time you are probably right. But before I accept anything from you, I still must ask the Lord. Here the little child, who was now with James, came over quickly and said to Joseph, Joseph, Go ahead and accept what Cyrenius wants to give you, so you may supply the house with foodstuffs. At this Joseph accepted the offer of Cyrenius, whereupon the latter promptly gave Joseph a sum of a thousand pounds of silver and seventy pounds of gold, for which Joseph tendered Cyrenius his thanks and took the heavy sum. Thereupon Cyrenius was overjoyed and affirmed, Brother, now my heart is a thousand times lighter. I am not leaving here today, but only tomorrow, for my too great love will not let me go. And Joseph was made very happy thereby. Chapter 232 on the burdens of money. Now Joseph had no trunk wherein he might put the money. At this Cyrenius at once ordered his servants to go into the city and buy a chest there at whatever cost necessary. And the servants went at once and in the short space of two hours brought an elegant cedar chest which had cost ten pounds of silver. This chest was then placed in Joseph's bedchamber, and Joseph's sons laid the large and heavy amount of money into the ornate and heavy chest. When the money was thus put away, Joseph said, Now I am, from a worldly standpoint, rich for the first time in my whole life, for I have never seen, and all the less owned, so much money. Until now, My house knew nothing of a thief, and still less of a robber. But from now on, all of us will not have sufficient eyes and time 
to protect this money from thieves and robbers. Here Jonathan observed, Brother, never mind about that. I know only too well whom the robbers and thieves seek out. See, they seek out only those who are mean and stingy. And that certainly does not apply to you, so you need not be concerned. For everyone who asks anything of you receives three times more from you anyway than what he asks for. Therefore I would say that you will no doubt have to deal with a lot of beggars, but certainly not with thieves and robbers. Here Mary also came over and said to Joseph, Listen, dear father, you know that while in the city of our father David, we also received a great burden of gold from the three wise men of the east who came from Persia. And behold, now we do not have any of it even the size of a grain of sand, although we were never robbed of it. So I would say that it will be the same with us here. Not a year will pass, and we will have nothing left of it without thieves and robbers. So just do not worry, for in a house where the Lord dwells, gold has no standing, and the robbers and thieves just do not want to have much to do in the Lord's house. For they know as well as I and you that it is tempting the supernatural to lay violent hands on treasures which lie, as it were, in God's poor box. When Mary finished, the little child also came over and said, Joseph, you faithful man, you must not look so fearfully at yonder chest in which my brothers have laid the money. For when you look so apprehensive, I get the impression that you are sick. Now see, I do not want you to be sick. This money will not burden you for any length of time at all. Buy quite a lot of flour now, and other foodstuffs, and some clothing, and distribute the rest among the poor, and the chest will be empty again in short order. These childlike words becalmed Joseph so greatly that he was promptly full of good cheer. Chapter 233 Jonathan Fells a Mighty Tree Joseph now called the four sons over and said to them, Here, take this pound of silver, and go into the city to buy flour and whatever else is still needed for the kitchen. And then come and prepare a good midday meal, since Cyrenius still honours me with his presence today. At this the sons promptly went and carried out their father's wishes. Then Mary also came over, and privately told Joseph that the supply of firewood was also so greatly depleted that it would hardly be possible to prepare a meal with the little that still remained. Here Joseph called Jonathan over and told him of this difficulty. And Jonathan declared, Brother, give me your large and strong axe, and I shall go into the forest over there by the hill, and truly, in three hours you shall have wood aplenty. Here Joseph gave Jonathan a strong axe, whereupon the latter went into the woods of the nearest hill, which belonged to the villa, and there quickly chopped down a strong cedar, fastened a strong rope around the trunk, and thus pulled the whole mighty tree in front of Joseph's house. When he arrived there with his felled tree, all were astonished at the enormous strength of Jonathan. Many servants of Cyrenius together now attempted to pull the tree further, but their efforts were in vain. For they, numbering about thirty, were not able to move the tree even a hair breadth, since it weighed about one hundred hundredweights. At this Jonathan said to the servants of Cyrenius, Instead of this vain attempt, just take big and little axes in hand, and help me to quickly split up the tree. This effort will please the head of the house more than if you try to measure my enormous strength on this tree by your vain effort. 
Here all the servants of Cyrenius promptly lent a hand, and with the energetic assistance of Jonathan, the whole tree was cut up in half an hour. Joseph was full of joy at this and asserted, Truly, that would have been three days' work for me until I could have cut up such a tree. And you needed hardly three hours altogether. And Jonathan retorted, Oh, brother, great bodily strength is no doubt a useful thing, but what is it against the strength of him who lives with you and before whose breath the whole creation trembles. Here the little child came over to Jonathan and said to him, Be still, Jonathan, and do not betray me, for I know when I must reveal myself. And if my power had not been with you now, you could neither have mastered this tree, but be still and say nothing about it. Here Jonathan said no more, and only now understood how he had so easily mastered this tree. Chapter 234 A Glittering Deputation Arrives from Ostracene Then Joseph's house was thus supplied with wood, and the sons of Joseph quite industriously began to prepare the noon meal. A deputation of very prominent citizens arrived in full regalia from the city to greet the supreme governor. For while no one in the city had heard anything this time concerning the presence of Cyrenius, because he wished to be there in strictest incognito, the well-known household servants as well as the sons of Joseph, was seen in the city that morning, and the presence of the governor was thus surmised. Therefore the leading citizens gathered in the city and came out in full splendour, which visit was most inopportune to Cyrenius on this occasion. The garrison commander and the from previous pages familiar captain were of course at the head of the large deputation from the city of Ostracene. The commander apologised profusely that he had ascertained so late, and then only by lucky chance, that his imperial consular highness was gracing this area with his exalted presence. And Cyrenius nearly turned away in his secret annoyance at this, for him, most untimely visit. But for all that, he now responded in a pleasant manner for the sake of political expediency, and answered the greeter in equally polite words. But after a while he unburdened himself to the garrison commander, saying, My friend, we prominent lords of the world sometimes fare quite badly. A common man can go where he pleases and remain in sweet incognito, but we need only to go a little beyond our doorstep, and our incognito is already gone with the wind. I do of course accept your stately greeting in the name of my brother with heartfelt appreciation, but it has to remain that I am here in strictest incognito, which means, in other words, this my presence here is unofficial and may under no circumstances be reported to Rome. If I were to find out that someone had dared to submit such a report to Rome, he will surely regret it. For mark it well, I am here in strictest incognito for the world. Why? I know why, and no one is to ask me about it. Go to your homes now, and put on ordinary clothing, and then return for the midday meal, which will take place about three hours before sunset. Here the deputation bowed before the governor and departed. Thereupon Joseph went over to Cyrenius and said, See, that is already the first result of the money which you gave me in such bounteous measure. Your household servants had to buy me a chest for it, were then recognised and your presence betrayed. 
As I have always said, gold and silver still bear the old curse of God. To this the little child, who was right at Joseph's side, added smilingly, Therefore one can subject the proud gold and the vain silver to no greater humiliation than to distribute it in just measure among the poor. Now you, my dear Joseph, do that all the time. Therefore the old curse will do you little harm, and the same to Cyrenius also. Oh, I am not a bit concerned over this gold, for here it is already in the right place. These words again put Joseph as well as Cyrenius at their ease, and they now awaited the invited guests in very good spirits. Chapter 235 Oh, you disgraceful born of the earth! At the prearranged time, the deputation returned from the city in different attire, greeted everyone in Joseph's house, and then went with Cyrenius to the already prepared meal. But since more unexpected guests were now gathered than had been anticipated, it was found that Joseph's table was too little to accommodate his family also. At this, the little child privately advised Joseph, Father Joseph, have a little table set up for us in the adjoining side room, and tell Cyrenius not to feel hurt on that account, since I shall surely come to him again after the meal. And Joseph thereupon did as the little child had advised him. Here Cyrenius objected. That will never do. If the Lord of creation is among us, we certainly are not going to put him in a corner at a table with the cats. Oh, that would surely be the most inappropriate arrangement on earth. I tell you, none other than he and you must sit at the head. And Joseph replied, My very dear brother, that really will not do this time. For there are many pagans here from the city, and for them the too great nearness of the Lord could have bad consequences. So the little child's will should be respected here as it is everywhere and always. And the little child also came over and said, Cyrenius, Joseph is quite right. Just follow his words. Here Cyrenius objected no more, and immediately went to the midday meal with his company and the deputation from the city. Thereupon Joseph quickly had a sturdy table placed in the adjoining room, at which he, Mary, the little child and his James, Jonathan, Eudokia and the eight children of Cyrenius took place. Naturally the foods of lesser quantity and quality was served at the table at which Joseph, Mary, the little child and his James sat, while the most and better foods came to the table of the guests. And the little child declared, O oh, you disgraceful born of the earth! Must you bring forth that which is most wretched for none other than your own Lord? O oh, you now fruitful land between Asia and Africa, for that you shall be smitten for all time with great unfruitfulness. In very truth, if our table did not have a few fish, there just would be nothing of which I can partake. Here is a cooked milk dish with a little honey, which I do not like, and there a fried sea onion, and there a small melon, and there some stale bread, and beside it a little butter and honey. That is our whole meal, nothing but foods which I do not like, with the exception of the few fish. Now I do not want that the guests should be worse off than we, but it certainly is not right either that we should be a lot worse off than the guests. Here Joseph said, Oh dear Jesus, do not be annoyed, 
for you see that we all fare the same. And the little child replied, Give me of the fish, and that will do for now. But another time things will have to be different, for I cannot always be satisfied with such poor fare. Joseph remembered this, and gave the little child to eat of the fish. Chapter 236 The Humility of the Lord Now, while he ate of the fish, the little child asked Jonathan, Can that be the best sort of fish? For I tell you, that this fish does not taste good to me at all. In the first place it is tough, and then as dry as straw. Truly, that cannot be a good sort of fish, which is also evident by its many troublesome fish bones. And Jonathan answered, Yes, my Lord and my God, it is truly the sort of the lowest quality. Oh, if Joseph had only said something to me sooner, I certainly would have gladly run back and forth ten times more and would have brought you the very best fish. Hereupon Joseph became irritated with his sons because they had taken such poor care of his table. But the little child said, We must not exactly become irritated on account of that. But it does always seem strange of my brothers that they keep the best in the kitchen to themselves and actually serve us the worst of everything. As far as that goes, may everything be blessed for them, but it is not considerate or praiseworthy of them. See, you have really given me the best piece of the fish, but I just cannot eat it, although I am still quite hungry, and that is a sure sign that the fish is bad. Here, taste this little piece, and you will be convinced that I am right. Here Joseph tasted the fish, and found the assertion of the little child fully confirmed. At this he promptly stood up, and went into the kitchen, where he found that the four sons were eating a tuna of the best sort. Thereat Joseph lost his patience, and he began to give the four sons a thorough dressing down. But the sons objected, saying, Father, we have to do all the hard work. Why then should we not eat a better morsel once in a while than those who do not work? Besides, the fish which we have given for your table certainly is not bad, but the little child is sometimes just too full of caprice because he has been spoiled by you and then nothing is right or good enough for him. This made Joseph angry, and he declared, Good, because you answer me with such speech, you shall never prepare food for my table again. Mary will be my cook from now on, and you may cook for yourselves what you will, but none of you shall ever be seen again at my table. Joseph then left the four sons, and in quite an aroused frame of mind returned to his table through a little side door. Hereupon the little child became sad and began to weep and sob unrestrainedly. At this Mary, Joseph and James immediately asked him with worried expressions what was the matter with him, whether he felt any pain, or what it might be that all of a sudden caused him to become so sad and distressed. And the little child sighed deeply and said to Joseph in a very melancholy tone, Joseph, is it really so sweet to show the poor and the weak one's authority and to condemn them for a minor offence? Just look at me for once. How many ever so miserably poor cooks do I have in the world who would long ago have let me, the father of fathers, starved to death if it were possible to do that with me. I tell you, cooks who have forgotten that I exist, and who do not want to hear or know anything about me. And behold, I nevertheless do not go out, 
so I may judge them in my just anger. Is it really so sweet to be a ruler? See, I am the only Lord of infinity, and besides me there is eternally no other. And behold, I, the Creator and Father of all of you, wanted to become a weak human being before you in full concealment of my eternal and infinite divine splendour, so that you, by this above all humble example, should come to despise your old spirit of despotism. But no, in none other than this time of all times, in which the Lord of glory has humbled himself below all men, so he may win them all in such lowliness of his. Men want to be lords and rule more than ever. I well know that you judged the four sons primarily because of me, but if you recognize me as the Lord, why did you anticipate me there? See, we are all far from being miserable because we have been served with a poor fish, for we can quickly have a better one prepared for us. But the four brothers are now the most miserable beings on earth, because you as their father have judged them. And behold, that is no just punishment for such a small offence. What indeed would you children of men be, if I did with you as you do with one another? and if I were as short of temper and as impatient as you are. You do not know why we were served so meagerly, but I know why. Therefore I say to you, Go over and withdraw your condemnation, and James will make the reason for the poor meal known to you. Here Joseph went, and called the four sons so they might acknowledge their error before him and be forgiven. Chapter 237 The Child's Love for His Brothers And the four sons promptly came into Joseph's dining room, where they quickly fell down on their knees, acknowledged their guilt, and besought their old father for forgiveness. Joseph thereupon forgave them, and withdrew his condemnation. Then he said to the four, I have indeed forgiven you, but I was also the least insulted by you in the matter. Now here is the little child, of which you said to me, to my greatest annoyance, that he was spoiled and therefore sometimes full of caprice at which time nothing were right and good enough for him. Thereby you have abused him most rudely. Go over and first of all ask him for forgiveness, or you could be severely dealt with. Here the four sons went over to the little child and said to him, O oh, our dear little brother, see, we have unjustly abused you to our father, and made him so angry that he nearly put a curse on us. We have sinned most rudely against you and the good father Joseph. Oh, will you, dear little brother, ever be able to forgive us our rude sin? Will you lift us up again to be your brothers? At this the little child smiled at the brothers in a most friendly manner, stretched out his tender arms, and said with tears in his divine eyes, O oh, my dear brothers, arise and come here, so I may kiss and bless you. For truly, whoever comes to me as you do, he shall be forgiven, though his sins were more than there is sand in the sea and grass on the earth. Truly, truly, before this earth was founded, I already saw this sin in you, and have already forgiven you long before you ever were. O oh, my dear brothers, do not have any fear because of me, for I do indeed love all of you so much that I shall in fact die one day in my body from love for you. So do not ever fear me, for truly, even though you had cursed me, I still would not have judged you, but would have wept instead because of the hardness of your hearts. So come here, my dear brothers, that I may bless you, 
since you have abused me a bit. This infinite goodness of the little child broke the hearts of the four, and they wept like little children. The others at the table also were so greatly moved that they could not keep from weeping. The little child then arose and went over to the four, blessed and kissed them, and then said to them, Now, dear brothers, you will surely know that I have forgiven you everything. But I beg you, go into the kitchen now and bring us all a better fish. For truly, I am still quite hungry, but just cannot eat the fish you prepared for us a little while ago. At this the four quickly arose, kissed the beyond measure good-hearted little child, and then, deeply stirred, hurried into the kitchen and prepared a most excellent fish for Joseph's table. Chapter 238 The Interpretation of the Poor Meal When all had stilled their hunger with the well-prepared fish on Joseph's table, and the meal was over, Joseph asked James if he could give him a possibly prophetic reason for the at first meagre and finally ever so tasty meal. And James answered in a most humble and unassuming manner, Oh yes, dear Father Joseph, in so far as the Lord will give it to me, to that extent will I faithfully tell you what this meal means. So I would ask you to listen attentively. All now directed their attention toward James, and he began to speak as follows. The poor and meagre meal exemplified that future time in which the word of the Lord will be misrepresented. At that time, his servants will keep the best part for themselves and will feed their congregations with the husks as the heathen feed their swine. The Jews will be like the fried sea onion, for although it is a root which grows luxuriantly by the ocean of divine grace and is now being fully roasted at the fire of divine love, it will for all that, be a poor food and a most scanty fare at the table of the Lord, and no one will reach for it. The monotonous milk dish will be the Greeks. These will indeed preserve the Lord's word in its true form more than anyone else. But since they will lead only an outward but not an inward life according thereto, they will be lukewarm, unscented and tasteless like this cooked dish which, although it contains the best life-giving ingredients, is cool and poorly cooked and thus makes a poor showing on the Lord's table also. For it has no pleasant odour and thus, as in effect raw, also has no pleasant taste for the Lord's palate. The melon is Rome. This fruit grows on a creeping stem, winding in all directions, on which many barren blossoms come forth. But a fruit appears behind only a few. And although the fruit is there and ripens to maturity, and in fact has a pleasant scent that is quite strong. Still, when it is cut open, and the inner meat is savoured, the taste is far inferior to the scent. If seasoned honey is not eaten with it, nausea to the point of vomiting quickly follows. Yes, even death can easily result from partaking of this fruit, this is the way it will be with Rome for a considerable time, and many will eat themselves to death at this fair. This fruit will also be present as a bad dish on the Lord's table, and will not be touched by him. 
Now we still have bread, butter, some honey, and a few lean fish. These foods are naturally somewhat better, are noticeably separated from the others, and appear to be quite acceptable. But there is no warmth in them either, for they have not all been seasoned with the main ingredient, the fire. Therefore, they also stand here on the Lord's table and are not praised. The fish, of course, were at the fire, but they had too little fat. Consequently, they are as tough as straw, and the Lord cannot partake of them either. These foods denote certain sects, which will separate themselves from the former, and will indeed have faith, but it will not be possible to discover any, or at least very little, love in them. Hence they also will not be pleasing to the Lord. That, in short, is the meaning of this meal. I have imparted everything made known to me, and since I received nothing more, I shall say no more. This explanation caused a great stir, but no one understood it. Chapter 239 One Flock and One Shepherd Thereupon Joseph said to James, You have spoken most wisely in the name of the Lord, although I, along with the others, still cannot grasp what you have spoken. But since I recognize the wisdom of God in you just the same, and we were all finally given a select and very tastily prepared fish for our table, I would also like to have you explain what this highly palatable and select fish finally represents. The Lord will surely reveal to you what is good also, since he has just shown you what is and will be bad for all the world. And James replied, Dear Father Joseph, that does not depend on me, but on the Lord alone. I am only a weak instrument of the Lord, and can only speak when the Lord loosens my tongue. So do not request of me what I do not have, and therefore cannot give you. But turn to the Lord in the matter. If he will give it to me, then you shall immediately receive it from me as he gives it. Here Joseph turned to the little child and asked in a low tone of voice, My Jesus, let me know the meaning of the good fish also. But the little child replied, Joseph, you can see that I have not quite finished with my fish, so be patient. Cyrenius also is still far from finished with his meal, so we too still have half an hour's time in which much can be deliberated and decided on. Thereupon he turned to James and said to him, James, while I am eating this small piece of fish, you may as well speak what comes to your mind. The little child then ate of his fish again, and James promptly began to speak as follows. This last good fish represents the Lord's love and his great compassion, which he will bestow upon mankind in that time when all the world will stand on the abyss of eternal death. But before this, the cooks will have to withstand a strong judgment. Only after this judgment will that time come, which the prophet Isaiah has already foretold. And this time will remain on the earth, and will not be taken from it henceforth. And the earth will be transformed into the likeness of the sun. And her inhabitants will also dwell on the sun's great fields of light, and will shine as they do. And the Lord will be Lord alone, and will be the shepherd himself, and all the shining inhabitants will be one flock. And thus the earth will remain for ever, and her inhabitants for ever, and the Lord will be among them for ever, a father to his children in eternity. 
there will be no more death. Whoever lives then will live forever and will never see death. Amen. Here James was silent again, and the whole company was altogether speechless from surprise at the great wisdom of James. Whereupon the little child finally said, And now I have finished with the fish, therefore, Amen to this also. Chapter 240 the poor testimony of the worldly neighbours. Soon afterward, the company arose from the table and thanked God for the bodily as well as the spiritual food, after which most of them went out into the open. Only Joseph, Mary, and the little child, along with James, went into the great dining hall, where Cyrenius was still at the table with his guests. He welcomed his dearest friends in a most friendly manner and wanted to get up at once and make room for them. But the little child said, Oh, stay, stay where you are, my dear Cyrenius. I am already satisfied if I just have the proper place in your heart. As concerns this place at the table here, it means nothing to me. I am now going outside with James. When you have finished your meal, come out after me. Thereupon the little child with his James ran quickly outside, and there conversed with him and the other children. This very intelligent and quite intimate speech of the little child with Cyrenius aroused the attention of several of the guests from the city, and they asked just how old this little child might be, since he already talked like a grown man, and seemed to be on very good terms with the governor. To this Cyrenius replied, What is it to you that I am a great friend of children? You have all seen that this little child is exceptionally gifted? But as to how he has attained such clear understanding at the age of hardly two and a half years, you will have to ask his parents, who will no doubt be able to enlighten you best in the matter. Besides, I am greatly surprised that you, as the nearest neighbours, do not know this house and its inhabitants any better by now. Here a few said, Well, and how should we really know this family better? To begin with, they never go anywhere, and in the second place, we just have too little time to visit this singular Jewish family, which is very difficult to fathom, for it has such a singular, mystical manner that one does not know exactly what to make of it. As far as we have heard from other quite insignificant people, this family is of course very peaceful and does much good to the poor. But there are some who say that they have seen this house as if it were in bright flames, which then went out again as quickly as one could say yes and no, and a number of other things like that. Therefore, we just do not have the courage to visit this family. For the old man is nothing else than a Jewish head sorcerer, and it is not good to have anything whatever to do with people of that sort. At this, Cyrenius laughed and retorted, Well, in that case, just keep on looking at it that way, for then this house is safe from you. At this the guests made big eyes at Cyrenius, and did not know what to make of this, 